Good morning. I just feel cooler with intro music like that. <laughs> By the way, uh, uh, John Ayakuchi, Jonathan, and uh, Stephen, for the last three weeks, did they not do a phenomenal job in helping us get better at prayer? <clears throat> We have just an amazing team around here, and uh, somebody says, aren't you worried you're going to lose your job? Yes. <laughs> They're that good. Um, this morning, I'd, I'd like to, uh, we're starting a kind of a mini-series, it's just three weeks, and I would like us to think about why we're here now, because we all know where we're going eventually, ultimately, to heaven. But a lot of people confuse their destination with their purpose. What are we supposed to do here? Wait? And Jesus doesn't say that. He says work. We have a purpose while we are here. As long as it is day, is what Jesus said. We should do the works of him who sent us. Now, what's interesting about Jesus is that when he worked, people were attracted to the work that he was doing. In fact, people who were unreligious were actually attracted to Jesus. I find that absolutely fascinating. How many here would agree today that the unreligious people in our culture are just so attracted to church? <laughs> So what does that mean? It means we are doing something differently than Jesus did. Or at least we're, maybe we're doing the same thing, but maybe in a different way. So I'd, I'd like us to think about this. Because when we do the works of Jesus in the ways of Jesus, those who are far from God will draw near to God. I want you to think about that. When we do the works of Jesus in the ways of Jesus, those who are far from God will draw near to God. Now, here's an interesting thing that happens to us in our journey of grace. Inevitably, there's probably something in our past that had a, a controlling and dominating influence in our lives. It shaped us in ways that wasn't healthy for us. And in our faith journey, when we experienced the grace of God, we found that we could overcome or freedom from those kinds of things. And those things had such controlling interests in our life that to be free from them is a remarkable experience. And that grace kind of shapes our perception, our perception of our identity. Who am I in the world and our behavior? What do I do in the world? Grace has this effect on us. So there are things that we allowed or that dominated us, and now what we've decided is that was not healthy for us, and we put them aside. Even if it had a controlling and, and uh, almost addictive reality in our life, we have found freedom from. And we no longer want or desire that in our life. Now, this is what's really interesting, is that once we have had that experience, we see that behavior differently. And then we see other people who are struggling with the same behavior differently. And we can become impatient with how long it is taking them to find freedom or victory in an area that we have found freedom and victory in. And sometimes our impatience increases our tone and our volume and maybe puts an edge on our words. We get impatient with the patterns and the behaviors and the lives of others who are wrestling with some of the same things. And somebody said, well, well what am I supposed to do then? I would actually recommend that we, we approach that with humility. What does that mean? It means that if there's something you've struggled with, rather than saying, that's a bad thing and you shouldn't do that anymore, maybe you could say, that used to have a real controlling interest in my life. And it affected me in ways that, quite honestly, it took me a long time to recover from. But I found something or someone that actually made a difference. If you ever want to talk about it, I'm here. That's a very different conversation. And quite honestly, a much more powerful one. 
the unrighteous were attracted to the righteousness of Jesus. Think about that. The unrighteous were attracted to the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus was perfect. He never said anything he shouldn't say. How many here have even one time said something you should not say? How many have said it more than once? How many have said the same thing you shouldn't have said more than once? How many, your spouse or your friends, call it to your attention. So what are you thinking? Yeah. Not only did he not say something he shouldn't say, but he never failed to say something that he should say. Yeah. Learning how to control four letter words in our vocabulary is not nearly as hard as finding our voice when we need to stand up and speak up. And Jesus never failed. He never did anything that he should not do. He never failed to do something that he should do. He defeated, rather tem uh, he defeated temptation rather than trying to recover from failure. And yet, this is what's fascinating, those who struggled with their own failures and their own weaknesses were attracted to Jesus. How did he do this? How was he able to live out righteousness in such a way that unrighteous people wanted to be near him and wanted their lives to change? I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that Jesus actually spent time with people who would not improve his reputation. Do you have any idea how much energy and time we spend trying to be in the circles of people where we feel like we belong or we feel like we could gain some ground in our position in life. And how much energy we spend trying to avoid people that we think would erode some opportunities or give some wrong impressions. People can tell when you're using them to gain access. They can also tell when you have no use for them. And Jesus didn't use people and he couldn't find anyone he didn't have use for. It's a very powerful thing. Jesus did not treat people that way. Jesus never, by the way, he never tried to improve other people's opinions of him. I don't spend a lot of time on social media. In fact, a terrifyingly little amount of time. I've got tricks to get in and out of it quickly. But I have noticed some of your posts. And what I've noticed is you are beautiful in all of your posts. <laughs> you are in the best places in all of your posts. You are eating the most delicious food in all of your posts. Your children are the best behaved children in all of your posts. You look intelligent. You look healthy. You look wise. You look well connected. You look well resourced. You, you look phenomenal. And now I see you here. <laughs> no difference at all. Same, same person. You laugh for a reason. Why do we only put the good stuff on social media? And I'm not suggesting that you should go put really bad stuff on social media. That's not the point. The point is, is there's always a ladder we feel like we're climbing. We're trying to get up rather than come down. And Jesus just did not manage life on those terms. In fact, he would spend time with people that he knew would erode his reputation with other people. And the second thing is that Jesus was gentle and respectful with those who were struggling and those who were failing. Jesus was gentle and he was respectful to those who were failing and those who were struggling. In fact, if you were hurting, if you were struggling, if you were damaged, Jesus seemed to be attracted to you. Do you have any idea how countercultural that is in every culture the world has ever had? When we're the damaged and lost and lonely one and Jesus is attracted to us, we're pretty happy about that. But once we experience that community with God and with others, sometimes we get a little less enthusiastic about reaching out to others who are also struggling with those same things. 
In, in Luke 15, it says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. They muttered, this is under their breath, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know what would have been a better statement? This man welcomes sinners and eats with them us. Somehow we separated ourselves because our lifestyle has improved, because our surroundings look a little bit better. Jesus never failed to have compassion on those who regularly fail. Now, I know you're wondering, are you ever going to get to the passage of scripture this morning? And the answer is yes, right now. And then some of you else are wondering, if he went this long on the introduction, how long is he going to preach? And the answer is, I haven't preached in three weeks. <laughs> Set your expectations accordingly. In Luke 19, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. There's the two things you need to know about this guy, chief tax collector. He's wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed up a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter. Muttering is a thing that people do when they feel like they have something to say, but they don't want to say it too loud. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, Zacchaeus is one of these guys that people love to hate. In fact, even in our culture, I don't think he would be highly respected. Uh, Two things about him is, is uh, he's, a, he's a government employee and uh, uh, responsible for collecting taxes, and that just automatically reduces the amount of people who will develop friendships with you. The second thing about him is he's wealthy. So it really doesn't matter whether you're on the conservative or the progressive side of things, you won't like this guy. He was a tax collector, but not just any tax collector. He was the chief tax collector, and he was wealthy, and, and because his tax collecting skills had benefited him. And by wealthy, that doesn't mean he just lived comfortably. He lived lavishly. He was a powerful man, and he was a greedy man. He's just the kind of person that people like to hate. Who, who do you think? Don't answer. <laughs> Just think about it. Who do you think people like to hate now? It's interesting when it tells the story, Zacchaeus did not go to this Jesus parade with a group of friends or family. He's all alone. People in Jericho didn't like him, and maybe he thought Jesus wouldn't like him much either. Our world likes to knock people like Zacchaeus down a notch or two. Jesus didn't knock him down. He invited him down. What a difference. It's amazing how offensive grace can be to people who assume they don't need it. Look at that Jesus. Eating. Spending time with sinners. Jesus will offend you. Jesus will offend you when he starts showing grace to the people you love to hate. That's what grace is. It's scandalous. It's highly offensive. Our world never gets used to it and never gets over it. So Jesus doesn't just search for good people or for bad people. Jesus searches for humble people. 
the only thing you can find guilty Jesus of is his guilt of association. He just hangs out with anybody. Now, you can be religious and proud, and that's kind of obvious because if you're very religious, maybe you're proud about how good a rule keeper you are and, and how many times you pray and, and how much you put in an offering and how many times you show up in rooms like this to hear guys like me talk on topics like this. I mean, there's just, there's a way we can become proud, and, and, but non-religious people can also be proud because they can see us as, as kind of archaic, out of date, superstitious, uneducated individuals who need someone to tell them how to live their life. And so there's pride that will run through the course, no matter what kind of religious or non-religious person that you are. But Jesus is not looking for proud. He's looking for humble. And you can find it among the religious and the non-religious. Receivers of grace, as it turns out, are more gracious. There were lots of people who were confused and maybe even offended that Jesus would invite himself into Zacchaeus' home. But Zacchaeus was not offended. He was delighted. Every one of us, every one of us was up a tree until Jesus came into our life. Until we recall the tree that we had climbed down from or the pit we were pulled up from, we will have a difficult time sharing the gospel with the people we've been called to reach. It's one thing to receive the grace of Jesus. It's another to extend the grace of Jesus. Luke 5 puts it this way. It says the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belong to their sect complain to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, Jesus is not looking for proud and perfect. Jesus is looking for humble. And I'll tell you, this picture of sickness is a really good picture because if you've ever been through a serious health issue in your life and you have to submit yourself to all the requirements of the medical community, Community, you learn humility fast. There's very few medical procedures they can do on you dressed as you are. It's all kinds of things that have to be done. And it's humbling. A sick person learns a lot of humility in the process of medical health care. It's a powerful thing. I would also say this, you can't really tell who's interested in grace. In Luke 18, the chapter before the story of Zacchaeus, there's another wealthy man story. Two wealthy men in two chapters. This guy was also rich. He was another thing that we all wish we were young. And there's another thing we wish we were. He was a ruler. He had everything going for him. But when he thought about his, his eternal life, he didn't feel like everything was settled. And so he asked Jesus, what, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus says, well, I'll keep the commandments. And you could just see the air come into his lungs and his spine get a little straighter and his countenance shine and his head lift up. And, and he, I have kept those since I was a kid. And Jesus says, that's great. Just one more thing. And what's that? So all you have, give it to the poor. Come and follow me. And the rich guy, the young guy, the wealthy guy, the religious guy, the guy who's kept commandments was very sad. And it tells us why, because he was very wealthy. And he walked away from Jesus that day. Zacchaeus did more than just receive the grace of Jesus into his home. He received Jesus into his heart and it changed him. He wanted to give half of everything that he owned away. I wonder what that would look like for us. 
I'm not telling you to give half your stuff away, but just in case we think that's an easy thing to do. And then he said, if I took anything inappropriately from someone, I'll pay it back and then I'll pay it back again and then I'll pay it back again and then I'll pay it back again. I'll pay them fourfold for what I took. And on that day, Zacchaeus went from being an outcast to an outgoing ambassador of God's grace. The question, don't answer again, just think about it. Does this story make you uncomfortable? Do we require people to get their act together before they can come to our church or into our home? Because if we do, we're going to have to misquote Jesus. That happens more frequently than you think. It's not our repentance that changes God's heart towards us. It's God's heart towards us that leads us to repentance. And Jesus just wanted everyone to know who God really was. Another question, don't answer it. Who do you love to hate? When you see their name or their image on television or social media, and you get frustrated, not only with them, but anybody who believes what they believe or follows them or supports them or likes them. I just don't understand what's going on with those people. Those people, do you hear it? That's the problem with Jesus. He eats and spends time with those people. Thank God he spends time with us too. Maybe you're not up the same tree that they are. Probably not. But I do think it's time to come down out of our trees and onto real earth. And it's time to open wide our arms and our hearts. And it's time to see what grace can do. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Jesus did not tell Zacchaeus that what he was doing was right. I, I understand there's a lot of our culture that wants us to approve. J Jesus didn't do that. He didn't tell Zacchaeus there was nothing that he needed to change. He didn't take Zacchaeus' side in an issue. He invited Zacchaeus to his side. Scripture is actually filled with imperfect people who struggled and failed and found God's grace over and over and over again. In this story, Jesus rescued Zacchaeus from a life that was killing him. The best thing you would have been able to say about the life of Zacchaeus before he met Jesus as he ate good food and he lived in a nice house and he slept in a nice bed. But everything else in his life was rotting away. And not just for the life that he had and the breaths he would breathe in the place we call earth, but for all eternity. And Jesus introduces himself, invites him down out of a tree, spends time with him, And all of a sudden, Zacchaeus got it. My house is not the most important thing. My bed, the food is not the most important thing. People, people are the most important thing. You are the hands and the feet of Jesus. So who are you reaching out to that might seem offensive to you or those that you know that might be misunderstood by those around you? You see, we're all started out as outcasts, but Jesus can now make us outgoing ambassadors of a kingdom of grace. It's what he's called us to. It's why we're here. We're not waiting. We're working. Let's bow our heads this morning. 
Father, um, it's so easy to, to cast stones. Well, we don't do it literally anymore, but there's lots of ways that we can make our point in harsh and unkind ways. Would you help us lift up our eyes and look for those who are in trees alone and regardless of what they're struggling with to invite them down to see what your grace might do in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.